Welcome into ATL Day Ones with Jarvis and Tanitra. Coming up on today's show, Trey Young tweeted out, we next? Next for what? And we're always talking about Batman and Robin in terms of NBA teams, but what about the Falcons? Do they have their own Batman and Robin in the secondary? And last but not least, in for the culture, Ponce and Boulevard about to be lit. It's all coming up next right here on ATL Day Ones. Let's get it. This is ATL Day Ones. Part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. I want to start off by saying thank you for making ATL Day One your first listen of the day. Remember, we are free and available wherever you download your podcast. And wherever you download your podcast, make sure that you leave us a five star review. Really appreciate that from you. In advance, ATL Day Ones is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Coming up in five minutes, I owe an Atlanta Brave an apology. But first, we got to talk about the NBA Finals last night. It went down to Denver Nuggets win, win the championship. We talked about on the show that that was more than likely going to be in the case. They ended up doing it in five games. And um, Nikola Jokic just the MVP of the league. But, you know, as I was scrolling through the Twitter – I saw uh, Mr. Trey Young T talking about, he tweeted out that uh, we next. And I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, how in the world or how in the hell are y'all going to get there? Because we talked about the roster decisions that they have to make, and Landry Fields is probably going into the probably the most important offseason that he has ever gone into in, a first, in his first year as being general manager of this team. So I think right now I'm – I feel like there's a way you can get there, and I feel like it, it it starts with continuity because we talked about the sample size that we saw with Quinn Snyder and working with this this current roster and how we start to see some bright spots. And I think that if the Hawks have to have to figure out a way to be patient and figure out that money piece for this roster, I feel like there is a a slither of a chance in order for them to kind of copy what the different Nuggets were able to do. Now, two questions for you. Mm-hmm. Definition of continuity, right. that's question one. And question two, when we say next, we next, are we talking about we next as in next Friday, Friday after next, <laughs> Friday next Friday down the road? Okay, I'm just trying to. Understand. Friday on another roster? Like, well, no. Make it make so, sense. So, so my whole thing, when I think continuity, I think about Mike, Mike Malone being there for eight years. This roster, Jamal Murray and, and, and Nikola Jokic being together for – five, six plus years, and also then bringing um, Michael um, Michael Porter Jr. into the fold and be having patience with his roster because a thing about, you know, in today's NBA, there's a lot of times where LeBron kind of, you know, he kind of started this whole thing as far as pulling, to get, pulling together different um, superstars and, and, and trying to make it work within a year, you know, because that's the type of patience people have nowadays. So the Denver Nuggets displayed some, some patience with this roster and and being that Trey Young has been in the league for five years and he had he's on his third head coach, that's what I mean about continuity. Gotcha. But, but having people stick around and be able to establish a system that they understand and being able to move forward with that. But here's the thing: the reason there's continuity there is because of the people that you're being co- continuous with. Ooh. Nikola Jokic, mm-hmm. Jamal Murray, yes. and to some degree, Michael Porter Jr. Yep. That's why you had the opportunity to stick with that for six to eight years, respectively, if you include Michael Malone, because of the quality, the level of now that's the next I'm talking about. That's the we next, because right. that's some next level play. That's some otherworldly play, if we're being honest, especially about Jokic and even for Jamal Murray, because he was my X factor. As yeah. I said it from day one, Nicole Jokic was the obvious. He was probably going to be MVP of the finals, but you're not going to win it without Murray having the lights out games that he had him being Mr. Double Double. Right. So yeah. where does that's not on the Hawks roster as currently constructed as far as the three. Yes. You might have a Trey and a DeJounte that yeah. would put you in the stratosphere of Jokic and Murray, but where's that third element. And then also for me, the continuity might actually be in their ability to make moves. The Nuggets just made a move in free agency in the middle of the NBA finals. That's continuity of thought process to see what it needs to be for going forward. I don't see that where we go from maybe the third 
part of the roster, the third person on the roster, the third point on the Hawks roster all the way through, except I would say continuity as it relates to give A.J. Griffin a chance, give mm -hmm. Jalen Johnson a chance, and give Onyeka Okongu a chance. Now, that continuity, I'm on board with. And if we want to talk about next and getting there, I don't believe that the Hawks are next this season. Let's just be honest about it oh, because no, yeah. this will be year two for Trey and DeJounte, but full year one for Quinn Snyder. So, but I do think it could be a Friday after next situation where yeah. maybe making the right moves in the off season and to the, your explanation of continuity, keeping the continuity in allowing several of those young players to grow. Now that I can see that would make it maybe Friday after next for the Hawks. Yeah, and I think and I think that you know you make an excellent point because you had guys like Aaron Gordon where people didn't really know what he was or what type of player he's going to be. And Denver was able to find that right. Contavious yeah. Caldwell Pope, they brought him in. He was a guy that he won a championship with the Los Angeles Lakers, and he was a guy that was that helped out that roster because he was the only one that had that ex that type of experience. So yeah, I think it's I think we, there's a way that the Hawk can get there, get that continuity piece. It's just it's going to take steps, and, and the Hawks are going to have to be patient. They can't say, hey, we're going to contend, be Eastern Conference contenders in 2023. Nah, it ain't working like that. Y'all got to – there are steps to this thing, and I think that the Denver Nuggets displayed that wholeheartedly. Now, T, you know, the uh, all-star votes came out, you know, um, the start of it. You know, the first rendition of it came out yes um, yesterday, and we know that nephew Ronnie – was the number one vote getter. He was the only guy that had a million over a million votes already, right? And but I think there was as I scrolled down through that list, T, I started to see some things that made my heart smile. And you know, when I when I get made happy, I have to look back and assess why I'm happy. And I'm happy because you know Orlando RC at the start of the season, T. Like I know I was calling for Von Grissom, and I was a big time Von Grissom supporter, and he I wanted him to be make, win that starting spot. But when Brian Snicker and Alex Anthopoulos named him. I questioned it. But now, to look back, I have to apologize to both Brian Snicker, Alex Anthopoulos, and also Orlando Arcia because he has put himself in position to be the guy at shortstop, at least for in the short term. Yeah, I, I appreciate him just being the – blue collar lunch pail type of guy like Absolutely. he was not the flashy that we were looking for because you got that flashy in what you saw in Vaughn Grissom last season yep. so at the mm -hmm. end of last season right so you're thinking okay great we'll see him take an exponential step the way typically players do when they're under the tutelage of Ron Washington and Absolutely. then you think Braden Shoemake well he's just that guy hot prospect young young prospect sometimes you overlook the wily steady and may I use our word from our NBA analogy, consistent veteran. Yes. Orlando Arcia is all of the above. 323 is a nice number. Five home runs, 19 RBI, that's a nice number. 846 OPS, that's a nice number. But more importantly, game in, game out, you get the same effort. You get the same level of solid play. And that's something that even the league is starting to notice in getting him into that all-star conversation. Yeah, and, and, that's, and, that's, and that's just amazing, right? And then... And on top of that, to add to that, how about Alex Anthopoulos signing him up for three years for seven million dollar contract? He like this the is deal. Still like the deal that Alex Anthopoulos does oh at gosh. the negotiating table. Unbelievable. This, this dude is something else when it comes to you know orchestrating a roster and making sure and signing timely deals and yes. bringing in timely players because he knows exactly what they're going to bring to the table once they put that Braves uniform on. And that's one of the things that you have to truly, truly respect and, and honor, you know, at, at this moment in time because we, Alex Anthopoulos is the GOAT. Like, that's where, I, that's where I'm at with it. Like, I don't care. Like, people can say what they want to say. But I, I think coming up next, though, T, when you think about the Atlanta Falcons, they – Traded for Jeff Okuda. They already had his uh, draft mate in 2020 in A.J. Terrell on the roster. What does that combination look like next year? We'll discuss that next. But first, I got to let you know that this episode of ATL Day Ones is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It is the number one sportsbook in America. Guess what, guys? NBA Finals just ended. Denver Nuggets won the chip. Did you get you some money? Did you check out what was going on? Did you play the over-unders? Did you do the uh, most three-point made? Like, did you get the leading score? Like, what are you waiting on? This is right here for you. And guess what? For all you new customers, guess what? 
they have the no sweat first bet. That's up to $2,500. Yes, let me say that again. $2,500 just for you. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. And guess what? You don't have to worry about all the flugaziness either. They're safe, secure, and it's super easy to use. And like I mentioned earlier, you can find all the any type of bet that you want is right there for you at FanDuel.com. So guess what, guys? All you new customers, I want you to go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more, make every moment more at FanDuel. It is the official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Three years, three years, three years. AJ Terrell has been pretty much on an island where, <laughs> hey, no one wants to throw to him because you know better than to mess with that guy, right? right? So AJ Terrell has really been one of the bright spots for the Falcons defense from day one. The challenge has been that there's not been a bright spot on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so offenses have taken advantage of that. Maybe Jarvis, maybe up until now, with the acquisition of Jeff Okuda in the offseason and the hiring of assistant head coach defense, Jerry Gray, whom we all know is like the DV whisperer. Maybe, just maybe, it'll be finally time for us to talk about a Batman and Robin that we're not talking about for the Hawks, but rather that we're talking about for the Falcons. There was an article that was recently posted as well, recently written as well, about the possibilities of just how special this duo can be. Jeff Okuda's also talked about his excitement about playing with A.J. Terrell and getting back to the level of play that you would be accustomed to for a number three pick in the draft. That said, how special, if all things being equal, can this duo be? I think it can be pretty special because – like, like I was just going back and looking at like who used to, who was paired with AJ Terrell in the past couple of years, and it's not good. T back in twenty twenty one, Fabian Moreau. Does that name ring a bell? <laughs> that that, that name we, we, we would call that, that that guy's name in the press box, you know, yes. quite often. Yes. <laughs> and not so, in a good way, but not in a good way at all. And then last year, Casey Hayward. They wanted to bring up veteran last year with Casey Hayward. Obviously, he started off pretty solid, but, you know, he ended up getting hurt. His body didn't, yeah. His body couldn't him. just hold up. And in comes Mr. Cornell Armstrong. And no need to go into how deep that that that, that stab was when yep. Casey Hayward. We missed Casey Hayward. Let yes. me just say that. <laughs> Even though we didn't get to see that much of him, we missed him. So, I think that when you have, you know, th those type of pairings going on, it's like it's easy for the offense. Because when, when you are in a space where – like, you can easily see it on film going into games and game plan. It was like, oh, yeah, we're not even going to throw two fours away. He's, we, he's, he can stay over there. That's cool. And, and if you're not going to follow the, our best receiver, oh, that's even better. So we're going to line up our guy on the backside of every play. And yes. we're going to call plays – it's exclusively Especially to go backside. Yeah. <laughs> right. So so those are some of the things that, that just – Make it make it so simple for on Sundays for for the opposing offensive coordinator. So now that you got a guy Jeff Okuda, now like he struggled his rookie year just like AJ Terrell had his struggles his rookie year, but as he went along and he was actually on the field his second year dealing with injuries, came back last year and had a solid season. Only mm -hmm. allowed what a fifty nine percent completion rate. You know throwing the, when they um, quarterbacks were throwing the ball this way, this pretty doggone good. And so we know that if Jeff Okuda is on the field and fully healthy, we know that he can get better. And with, like you said, the DB whisperer that Jerry Gray is, like he said, those were his words. He said he wants to get his hands on Jeff Okuda because he knows the talent is there. Like, I really feel like this is lining up to be something really special. Yeah, and Jerry Gray, when, when asked that question, when I asked him that question, I was just curious to know, like, and you're talking about a couple of things, actually, that we were – we asked him, you had a question for him that I brought to the table. I had a question for him. And our guy, Joe Patrick, had a question for him as well. And all of those things kind of go back to that one point of let me at him. Yeah. He's and, and so one of the answers that I love that Jerry Gray said to me was, Jeff Okuda's never been coached by me. No offense, Detroit. No offense to anyone on the Lions staff. But he's never been coached. He by said Houston something first. then. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, I dare somebody to come for him with that comment, because when you right. look down the list and it's really just too long to even mention all of the DBs that he coached up and got them into Pro Bowl caliber play, Hall of Fame caliber play. I can remember actually a comment that he made after one of the worst games 
for the secondary for the Green Bay Packers. He said, oh, it won't happen again. It won't happen again. And when you started looking at their numbers and you just mentioned it uh, just a moment ago, the percentages of being thrown to you know one side, they it changed exponentially, right? Because, right. And, and apologies for forgetting that, that DB's name, but there's one DB for the Packers that everybody just came in. Oh, we'll just throw at him. We'll just throw at him. And Jerry Gray said, let me give me one more game. You're never going to see it again. And then you just saw the numbers just be mo much more even. That's part one. So we yeah. know that he's able, able and capable of seeing what two DBs, what two solid DBs can do, even when he doesn't have that kind of talent. The way he was chomping at the bit, and you yeah. can kind of see – kind of the wheels eyes, turning yeah. you know, when I was asking that question. <laughs> he's like, he really believes he can get Jeff Okuda back, not just to what we saw out of Okuda with the Lions last season, but more importantly, what he's what we saw out of him at Ohio State that made him the number three pick in the draft. I think that's critical. The other piece there is this. We can look at the numbers all we want, but yeah. there's a piece there that Jerry Gray spoke of as well that go beyond the numbers, and it's about communication. Right. And it's about the ability to be able to look at the raw talent, the intangibles, the tangibles and say, OK, this is what A.J. Terrell brings to the table. This is what Okuda brings to the table. How am I going to bring those together, not just to affect the improvement on the outside with the corners, but also to affect the DB room as a whole? Because we've been talking about the fact that at safety, you know, we're hoping that we get to see that Reggie Grant again, right? We're yeah. hoping that we get to see that Jalen Hawkins again. And of course, I'm talking about the younger core because that's where you hope Jerry Gray has his biggest impact. So Absolutely. yeah, I agree with you. I think that there's an opportunity there for them to be a special duo because of the raw talent that they have, but also because of a man who can tap into the raw talent. Now, speaking of a group that's looking to improve, Jake Matthews had some interesting comments after minicamp voluntary OTAs rather wrapped up last week because of course today, the Falcons kick off mandatory mini camp this week. We'll be down at the bends today. I'll be there today. You'll be out in flowery tomorrow. So of course we'll talk to you guys more about the reaction from what we've seen in mandatory mini camp this week. But after OTAs last week, Jake Matthews was excited Jarvis. He was excited mm -hmm. about what this team has been doing, what this group, this O-line group has been doing this off season to get themselves to be better than what they were last year. And this is one word that I really liked that he kind of highlighted. He said, you know, we were really good in our run protection and we want to be that. But we yeah. saw what we were last year and we believe that we can be stellar to the point where our protection on pass can improve. And we and really, he said it and I don't want to misquote him, but he essentially said we will we have an expectation and we will see wins as the result. So to me, that's the definition of success that they're going by. They're not just saying we want to improve pass protection, but they're talking about wins. I have a theory about what that means to me. What yeah. that means to me, Jarvis, is not just getting into the red zone because the Falcons were fine getting to the red zone. Right. It was the productivity in low red zone in terms of touchdowns that we didn't see. What do you expect to see out of this O-line as far as what Jake said, where they were last year and where they are this year? I expect them to be more balanced. Because here's the thing, right? Like the number three running team in, in, in the NFL, no problem at all. And you're potentially going to have a, a, a rookie in there at that left guard spot. That's okay, even if he's not as good as the Falcons think he's going to be. Because at the end of the day, all it's all about continuity. That, that's the key yes. for that's word for the day, continuity. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're talking about the offensive line. As long as those five guys are on the same page, the talent level, it matters. But as long as those guys know exactly where each other are going to be, is those are some of the things that you can work with and be on a better scale. So, but my expectations for them is be more balanced, be more balanced because, like, obviously we know they want to be able to run the football. But the thing that's going to be the the game changer for them this year, T, is the how successful they are on play action on third downs and, and and when Arthur Smith dials up those shot plays. If they're able to hit those shot plays to get into the red zone because they we know that more than likely they're going to continue to run the football like they did last year. But I think being able to take those plays and get those 
those those extra bodies out of that box and, and have those teams start to back up a little bit because we know they're going to be sl- lurking. Those safeties are going to be lurking all the time. Eight, eight nine-man boxes, they're going to get used to that. So it, it's important for Desmond Ritter to be able to hit those shot plays when Arthur Smith dials them up, and that's my expectation. That's how this, this offense is going to get to that 25 to 27 points per game that they need to get to in order to get more wins like Jay Matthews talked about. And my expectation there as well is this. We don't want to see 11 runs in a row. Yes, it's great that you were able to pull that off multiple games last year, right? And it was successful for you. But balance, (laughs) exactly. But balance really is the name of the game. I would Mm -hmm. love to see something like, I don't care if you run it five times in a row, that's fine. But I really want to see, like you said, the run set up the pass on that sixth play. And I want to see Desmond Ritter, Dave Ragone, and Arthur Smith take advantage of all these pass catchers that they now have on offense. So that's really where I believe you're going to see some red zone effectiveness that you didn't see last year is if you can really show teams that you can mix it up. It doesn't matter that you have Bijan Robinson and Tyler Algier and Cordero Patterson and you're able to run it 11 times in a row. That's not good football for down the road because yeah. let's let's be honest, Kansas City had a solid running back the eagles had a solid running back but what set them apart was the fact that like you said the play action what set them apart is that they took advantage of who they had in their passing not just their passing room but we'll just say pass catchers overall so yeah i I love that jake matthews had that kind of honesty and had that kind of confidence and what they'll be able to do in an area where we know they've struggled with just pass protection so but what do you guys think what do you everydayers want to see out of the falcons as they go into this final week of minicamp mandatory minicamp and then they get ready to take a quick break before they come back for training camp. Always let us know your thoughts on YouTube. Drop a comment in the comment section. And don't forget, wherever you download your podcast, download ATL Day Ones too. But T, this is for the culture. It is the intersection between sports, entertainment, the culture, and sometimes whatever the hell we want to talk about. Because that's just how we get down in the show today. It's no different, T. When we think about like what the city of Atlanta and what, you know all the things they represented, right? I think Chick-fil-A kind of falls like, Top five, more than likely. Like, you know, you can add whatever you want on the top of that list. But I think they definitely qualify to be top five as far as truly, truly representing what's going down in the city of Atlanta. Now, there is a new location. Now, T, I've been doing my homework on this one because I I, I saw, you know, I kind of I frequent that area right there off Ponson Boulevard. That's the intersection that I frequent quite sometimes. Like, that's my that's like that's my late night slow roll. What I mean by that is, T, you know me, I used to eat real late, you know what I'm saying, back in my heathen days. I used to stop at that Popeye's right over there or that Wendy's, you know what I'm saying? Depending on what the line was at that Popeye's, I used to stop at that Wendy's right there. But now, they've added a Chick-fil-A over there, T. Like, when I think about dropping a Chick-fil-A right there in that area, when I say uh, a Mr. Miles, what is I think his name is Jamirian Miles, who's the owner, an operator of that Chick Fil A, he is about oh, to yeah. get paid. Hey, <laughs> Jamirian, that's my guy. <laughs> yes, he's the only yeah, one of Glenwood. Chick- yes, this yeah, he's the, the Chick Fil A mm-hmm. operator over in Glenwood. Yes, he is. Oh my <laughs> goodness, I'm so excited for him. You know, it, and the name did not click uh, when I read the article until you mm-hmm. literally said it because you know you'll get freebies. But after a while, they just kind of know who you are because you come in there so frequently. So so now I get to frequent another one because you can pretty much hit that uh, Ponce Boulevard intersection from the backside of uh, the Colony Square State, where the radio station resides. But yeah, it's so interesting too, Jarvis, because it's amazing to think about spaces and places where iconic restaurants aren't like... I remember in Louisiana, right? So mm-hmm. just to take you back really quickly, our first one was actually a in the mall. We didn't have a standalone. And yep. yeah, and this was very foreign to us, like chicken on a bun. What are we supposed to do with that? Right. But whoever was the owner operator stayed the course and that Chick-fil-A slowly but surely became like a go-to. And then for us, our, our small town has just steadily become like a little city now. And mm-hmm. we have an MLK, it is the heartbeat of my town that I grew up in and Chick-fil-A was like, that was a no brainer. Like Chick-fil-A had to be there anchoring all the rest of those restaurants. And listen, in Louisiana, it's not easy for Chick-fil-A to be popular because we're a Raising Cane's type of type of city, Raising Cane's type of state, right? So So, yeah, the buck starts and stops (laughs) for us with Raising Cane's. But let me tell you, Chick-fil-A holds its own because again, 
that could not have been a flagship situation without having Chick-fil-A in that space. And like you said, I can't believe now that you're mentioning it, that all of those restaurants over there, you've got a McDonald's and a Zaxby's, you have an IHOP and you have- Cookout. Yeah. I, yeah, everything. That's, so yeah, that's, many. A, that's a slow roll right, right there. Around the corner. <laughs> yeah, right, right off the edge, uh, just a little bit off the beaten path, a Burger King and a DK and a Pizza Hut. So you've got all of the staples yep. and even a Krispy Kreme that you know is on its way to return. Yes. And no, no Chick Fil A, like, oh, or as yes. one of my exes used to say, no Chicken Fil A. Like, <laughs> what is this? Yeah, right. Yes. So yeah, that is so exciting. Wait, 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 wait. Hold, yes. on, hold on, hold on, T. Hold on, hold on, T. What? Like you actually used to date somebody that used to talk like that. I know it was tough. He's brilliant. <laughs> He's brilliant. That's the only reason. Because yeah. you know, like there is a you know a lot of people won't, don't even know. You know, if you you know listen to this show, or you, this is the first time checking in. You know, Tanisha is from New Orleans. You know, you know what I'm saying. So there is a certain dialect that I absolutely love hearing from female you know females down there you know what i'm saying like you know if i didn't marry the the woman that i married i probably would have married a, a woman for her knowledge accent but you know but t like she you can't tell like you can't tell that you know she you is i call her new orleans bougie you know what i'm saying like that's why i say and the whole is. word new orleans bougie i pronounce yes. it the, that way when i'm referencing to because Nisha you're Batista. supposed to <laughs> yes it's not, absolutely. We have, we're like, tired of telling no people it's not no it doesn't exist some idiot created that and it's the dumbest thing ever because we don't say it and neither should you but then again jarvis allows me to say atlanta and pronounce both t's so i guess i'll let him say no there you go. See, like you know, what I'm saying this is the a mutual partnership here. You know, we give each other grace around on this show. You know, what I'm saying that's really, what we really. do. But <laughs> who we will not give grace to if they dare drop another game in Detroit would be the Braves. But we don't oh, see that gosh. because we think Spencer Strider is going to go out there and he's going to yeah. deal. He had a little bit of a rough outing the last go round. Spencer Strider doesn't typically have two rough outings in a row, so hopefully he'll be able to get it done. And it's an early bird special, so to speak. It's a 640 start. He'll be facing off against Reese Olsen. So that's what we want to come back to you guys and talk about a dub in Detroit tomorrow. Also want to come back and give you guys our reaction to day one of mandatory minicamp. It's down at the bins today, so that'll be some exciting stuff. And of course, any and everything, because now, Jarvis, that we have gotten to the point in place where the NBA Finals is a wrap. You know what it is. It's going to be commentary and all kinds of postulating about the NBA draft and free agency. So you want to know about it from this show, Everydayers, you know what to do. Check us out on YouTube. Drop some comments ahead of tomorrow's show. We may actually address them and talk about them in the show. And, of course, download us wherever you get your podcasts. And last but not least, before we get out of here, make sure that you guys both share love, show love, and most importantly, spread love.